team. Uh, you will be answering all of the questions that you asked today at the end of the discussion, uh, but we encourage you to ask questions at any point. You can also use the chat to chat amongst uh, yourselves as audience members, but just remember there is another person at the end of that username. Uh, so this week we are talking about new media and digital art practices, and that's art that happens on computers and over the internet. And so while this art and our conversation about this art happens uh, through cyberspace, the infrastructure of the digital world relies on resources drawn from the physical land. Uh, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the land we are gathered on here, uh, Treaty 4 territory, um, which is the homeland of the Cree, the Soto, the Lakota, the Nakota, the Dakota, and the Métis people. You are gathered wherever you might be on the other side of the screen on your computer watching our live stream. So thank you very much for that. Um, we are joined by our returning uh, champion live stream co-host and uh, wonderful co-worker Lillian O'Brien Davis, uh, the curatorial assistant at the Mackenzie Art Gallery. Hi, Lillian. Nice. Thank you for being here. It's our utmost pleasure. Um, and so our featured guest, uh, extra special guest tonight is um, Shauna Jean Doherty. Uh, hi, Shauna. I was wondering, could you uh, provide us a, a little bit of an introduction about yourself? Oh, wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. I think, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I think I'm not getting the audio. Uh, into my computer. Um, just a second. Uh, figuring, I know, figuring this out right now. It's because we just got these new Bluetooth headphones that makes it look really slick that you can't tell that we're... Okay, say something again there, Shauna. Nice. Great. Okay, sorry. Yes, perfectly. <laughs> Great. Cool. Um, we are just getting feedback on your audio levels. Uh, let's just double check the audio levels one more time. Yes. Nah. Um, oh, okay. Yes. I think I know why. Just a second. Um, sorry, I still had the audio messed up there, Shauna. That's my fault. Uh, yes, I feel awful about that. But um, that was such a good intro. Uh, can you say something again now, Shauna? <laughs> uh, howdy doody. <laughs> Hello, testing. Um, anyone out there in... Okay, uh, uh, anyone out there in computer land? Um, can you tell me if you can hear Shauna? Uh, it, it makes makes some more noise over there. Okay. Thumbs uh, up. We've got one th thumbs up. Thumbs up on Twitch for hearing Shauna. <laughs> oh. People are always more uh, uh, likely to comment when something's not working than when something's working. <laughs> we found out. Okay, okay we're all we've good. We've got a good. We've got good. Shauna, Shauna uh, since you hi. practiced it so well just two minutes ago, uh, maybe could you give the wonderful intro you gave again? <laughs> for sure, for sure. Okay, third oh, time's the charm. Um, I'm Shauna Doherty. I am a um, independent new media art curator here in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credits. Um, I used to be the curator at InterAccess, which is a new media art um, artist-run center in Toronto. And before that, I worked at Vivo Media Art Center in Vancouver. Um, and now I work at OCAD University um, in the Writing and Learning Center. So I my practice revolves around um, new media art criticism and curating. And I did um, my MFA at OCAD uh, 
uh, in art criticism and curatorial practice. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and I studied under um, Caroline Langell, who is a new media art historian. And um, she sort of introduced me to the history of media art. And um, she has sort of a feminist bent towards her her own curatorial practice. So that has influenced me a lot in um, in my own activities in the curatorial realm. That's awesome. Um, Thank I, you. Well, uh, yeah, I'm excited to get a taste of uh, um, that through the like presentation that we're going to go through tonight, um, which you've uh, graciously uh, provided for us, Shauna. Um, so we're going to be thinking about uh, new media art uh, and talking about it um, th through through the lens of looking at the work itself. Um, but yeah, let's. Uh, I th I'd say uh, we should dive right in. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Um, I just want to acknowledge uh, this image that we have up here first. Uh, it is by Aaron G and was on, um, this work was on view at the Mackenzie, as far as I understand, uh, very recently. Um, oh, Jonathan and Kat has emphasized that we look at new works that most of the audience hasn't seen before. So we will um, scurry right along to our next slide, if that's okay. It's time was uh, tragically cut short by the pandemic and quarantine and everything. But yeah, those, it was sad to think of those robots singing by themselves in the, in the gallery with no one there to hear. <laughs> Kind of cool too. Yeah, totally. Get to the next slide. Oh yes, I forgot. I'm in control of the slides, so if they go slow, it is all my fault. Okay, sorry. Um, so this is me. You can skip to the next slide. Um, so I'm really quickly gonna go over some of my recent projects, maybe to get a taste of um my perspective in relation to new media art and um. We're going to really take a position of an introductory mode. Um, so hopefully this this live stream is as accessible as possible. And um, we're just going to really try to discuss the the like foundational principles of media art. Um, so this piece here is by Tasman Richardson, and it is from an exhibition that I curated called Kala Yuga. Um, this piece is interactive and uses analog um, video cameras and uh, projection. It's uh, interactive and it was shown at Arsenal in Montreal. Um, and it's coming to Toronto in September. So folks who are listening in from Toronto can um, see it hopefully uh, all goes well in Ontario vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic. We just had um, someone say in the chat that they are listening from Toronto, so relevant content. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it would be so awesome to chat with people in human form uh, about media arts. <laughs> uh, I miss that very much. Um, so just quickly about this show, there were six pieces. Uh, many of them were interactive, so it was very like technologically demanding. Um, and I wrote the curatorial essay based on the um, novel Crash by J.G. Ballard, which focuses the, the themes within that book are um, sex, death, and technology. Uh, so that's just a little sneak peek for those of you who might catch the show in Toronto. Next slide. Um, this is me at InterAccess. <laughs> uh, this is a solo show that I curated um, with works by Nancy Patterson, who actually has um, passed away since the show was presented. Um, Nancy was a pioneering feminist media artist. She had to compete with like a very um, male-dominated media art space in the 80s and early 90s. Um, it was so rad. And this piece is called Bicycle TV. It's from 1989. And the way it worked, um, audience members could interact with it. You hopped on the bicycle and you biked through 
this, uh, this space that was shown on the monitor. And then you could turn and it would turn up the street. It was filmed, uh, the location was Bracebridge, Ontario. So it was sort of a small town Ontario tour. Um, and many artists have sort of not copied, but reproduced this concept in that there's an interactive object and then you're navigating a space. Um, but the fact that this was created in 1989, I think is really significant. Um, and Nancy and I had to, uh, sort of, we had to work on this piece because it had been in storage for decades before we presented it. Um, so that, that is a feature of media art for sure. Uh, even she like couldn't quite recall technologically how the piece functioned. So we had to um, get a lot of technicians in and um, re remount work, which was really fun. Yeah, you sort of mentioned the sort of technically demanding uh, nature of most media art when it comes to installation. Uh, I can just imagine there's no one size fits all solution as a curator for whatever media art piece you might be installing. For sure. And since this piece was from, um, like I mostly used to working with works from 2000 to the present day. So this was mm -hmm. working, working with technology that I had never encountered before. Um, so, yeah, it was a challenge, but I'm really you preserve, you preserve a lot of the tech then to be able to kind of like be like, oh, I need this like particular thing that was only available in 1985. Like you have that sort of stuff available. Yeah, so those um, that is like very dependent on the organization and is really related to the amount of space that they have available. So Interaccess doesn't have a ton of space for storing um, obsolete technology, but Vivo, for example, has a uh, technology archive. So they're better equipped to remount historical artworks. And for this piece at Interaccess, we really relied on Nancy for having um, like really dusting off pieces of technology. And another piece in this show uh, relied on three video disc players, which is a technology that I'd never encountered before. <laughs> they use these laser discs that are like the size of records. <laughs> and uh, they have this very amazing physicality to them. You can hear them sort of whirring up and uh, spinning. And the Nancy was very concerned that dust would get into the video disc players while the show was on. And if that happened, it would be incredibly hard to find replacement video disc players. So it's a very tenuous rope to walk in terms of like presenting archival media art. The, even if the art is maybe software based or not necessarily uh, yeah, it not not did it wasn't made thinking that it would go hand in hand with the hardware. You end up having to uh, archive the hardware that it's contained within as well. Exactly. Yeah, and I think larger institutions like the Art Gallery of Ontario are better equipped at preserving the technology. Um, but then sometimes when a media artwork gets collected, um, curators and artists will established agreements that will say like, how can we reproduce the concept of this work without hardware that might outlive the concept of the artwork? And it'd be a good opportunity to say a uh, sound out in the chats if you remember laser discs yeah. or just with uh, whatever <laughs> your favorite obsolete media might be. Um, We'd love to. If you it. have any in your basement <laughs> that you want to contribute, donate Don't them to a curator. I, yeah, donate them to your local curator. <laughs> so it's so fascinating. I feel like um, as the kind of resident um, new person to new media art, or so, or the the person who's like less knowledgeable about it in our conversation. I guess I don't realize how much like the kind of like. Um, the like fetish of the material or something like acquiring these sort of like uh, pieces of technology or like um, in pieces of like infrastructure that help these shows like continue to be shown. And um, 
like ha- like work kind of becomes about that as well and like especially over time even things from like the 90s don't seem that far away but i imagine like trying to find even like a vhs player <laughs> is like more and more difficult as time goes on totally and then as curators of our generation lillian um curate shows we're encountering technologies that yeah we haven't dealt with before so and that too <laughs> We need to educate ourselves about those things. Because no other part of our society, um, no other part of our society really has the same sort of need for um, archival access uh, to, yeah. to these old things. Like there's not, it's a sort of only art institutions, curators and, and artists who ma- were making uh, work for older media who are like, going so there i guess what i'm saying is there's not a huge incentive in our society for like i don't know there to exist for there to exist businesses although i know that there are some businesses that are coming up uh who are that exist around uh archiving media art i and i hope there will be more of them for (laughs) sure Um, Yeah, it really goes against the logic of like planned obsolescence and this principle of progress in technology. So the valuing of old technologies is really um, in tension with capitalism. (laughs) I may be so bold. I would agree. Um, So this next show really quickly uh, was presented at Vivo Media Arts Center. It was part of the wrong... uh, Digital Art Biennial. Um, it was called The New Flesh, and it was co-curated with um, two media artists, Erica Lapidat Jansen and Eric Zepka. Um, it involved a lot of projections, and Vivo has a really lovely warehouse space, so um, the projections were huge. Uh, and it was um, it featured that artists from all over the world, which is a really fun function of internet art because the artists don't necessarily need to come and install the work. They can send you a digital file and then all of a sudden you have access um, to works by artists, you know, from England and the Philippines and Australia, uh, which is not the case, you know, with a typical, well, it's definitely possible, but in the artist run context that I'm used to, it can be hard to get um, international artists into, into the space. Um, okay, and this is the last thing about me. Uh, oh my gosh, and it's already 20 after 9. Um, <laughs> this is an article I wrote about artists experimenting with artificial intelligence in S Magazine. That is all I will say about that. <laughs> we'll come oh, okay, so what work. is new media art? Mm-hmm. Um, so I was introduced to... Uh, sort of the theories and discourses around new media art uh, in 2012, which is eight years ago, but still feels relatively new. I'm constantly learning about the form. Um, so I don't want to position myself as like the supreme expert in this area, but it's definitely an area that I work in and that I'm interested in. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So you'll be able to recognize new media art uh, because of its common features, uh, which are interactivity, the use of networks, the use of computers, and an emphasis on the process um, rather than the final outcome of the artwork. Within my definition of new media art, I include objects that are responding to digital culture. So it doesn't necessarily have to manifest as a digital piece that is presented on a computer. It can also be a sculpture, a print, or a painting, um, which we will see with some of the the artworks that we have as examples uh, later on in the live stream. So um, yeah, New Media Art presents a range of challenges uh, that uh, you don't necessarily encounter with static works, like a painting or a sculpture. Um, So logistical challenges arise when it comes to exhibition, dissemination, preservation, and classification. 
media art takes many, many forms, especially as new technologies are emerging. Um, so I've listed some of them here. In my practice, I tend not to include digital photographs or digital video as new media art, um, though I'm definitely open to other definitions of the genre. Um, but for me, the most important part is that there's a critique of the technology itself going on through the application of the technology. So yeah, the special thing about digital artwork is that it challenges uh, some basic conventions of the art market, which allows it to be quite radical. Um, it is infinitely re reproducible. It's easily circulated, um, which really flies in the face of uh, scarcity, which is sort of the central value of the art market. So if an artwork can be copied and circulated over and over again, it doesn't have that same aura as a painting, perhaps. Um, but I, there's a lot of um, productive thinking that can uh, come from that quality. So digital artists often uh, possess values of openness, access, and transparency, and are working with those values um, in relation to their works. Uh, I like uh, something I, that occurred to me in what you were talking about earlier of the sort of ease of collaboration that uh, digital, that new media art might lend itself to where these artworks can travel sort of easily over space. But then like we were talking about earlier, they don't travel over time very well where things are quickly made obsolete or, or what have you. Totally. And especially with um, internet works that are, um, reliant on like certain web browsers or certain plugins mm -hmm. or flash or, like internet works can become obsolete within a year um, which is kind of concerning but that's why we have organizations like rhizome in new york who work to preserve internet arts um, and so they're a super important organization so or, or um, digital art, you can access digital art from many different lenses. Um, so I've listed the sort of like many histories and um, realms of thought that are associated with new media art. So you can think those through, or maybe those are ways that from your perspective, you can access new media works. And these are some questions that I find myself um, asking when I'm encountering digital artworks. We're going to share a slideshow, so I don't need to read them out. And um, mm. you guys can go over them if you're interested later on, I think. Sweet. So we can get to the art. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, my experience themes seem to recur in new media artworks, exhibitions, and uh, their criticism. Um, some of the works that we're going to show today, uh, I've put in bold the uh, subjects that they're addressing. Um, let's, let's just get into it. Nice. Um, oh, yeah. I wanted, so for those of you who are just sort of entering into the media art and I wanted to highlight this new text um, that came out in 2019. Uh, there, so within this text, there are essays on archival and contemporary media artworks by Indigenous, racialized, and LGBTQ artists and administrators. Um, so it's a really great place to start if you are just sort of diving into the Canadian media art world. This is where it all started, I think. Um, 1968, Cybernetic Serendipity. Uh, so this exhibition um, was presented in London uh, and it was curated by Jassia Reichardt. It introduced um, the world 
to computer art aesthetics. This exhibition um, featured robots, a computer that was the size of a room, um, and it had artists who were collaborating often with engineers because techno like computer technology was not accessible at this time. Um, so artists were really relying on access to technology through, through engineers. So it's a really great example of um, the collaboration that can happen between those industries. And that collaboration was really popular throughout the 90s and the early 2000s. And I find it a little less common now, um, though large sort of tech Corporations do have artists in residence, like Facebook has an artist in residence, Google has an artist in residence, um, but that more like grassroots collaboration, I, I don't witness as often. So we will talk about the exhibition World Building, which saw people who were very adept at technology collaborating with artists um, who had experience with technology, but those collaborations were really productive in that exhibition. Oh, I have okay, to. Okay, uh, so. Sorry, let me switch our sources. Okay. Oh, is Shauna still coming across on this one? I believe so, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay Hopefully, I, this works because sound is essential. Yes, the video. Um, uh, Lillian and Shauna, you won't be able to see the video, but our audience will hopefully be able to see and hear this video of David Rokeby. <laughs> Amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, feel free to just talk over it. There's yes, it's no playing. Audio it's, right now. <laughs> it's playing now. Right, right, right. There's like the the beginning credits. Yes. Let's say really quickly that. This is a really important interactive media artwork by David Rokeby. It was shown at the Venice Biennale, um, and we'll see how it works. But the body is very central, um, and the body basically makes music. And we'll see what I mean. I'll, we'll just let it play for a, for a minute or so. I'm picking up on some Aaron G uh, lineage here. The sound, uh, a mistake that I had made earlier came back to bite me again, uh, but people should be able to hear the sound now. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, I messed up some of that. Uh, uh, okay, so people, I messed up the sound uh, at the last bit. Um, people, it, it worked towards uh, the end. Um, sorry, that's my fault for... It's also available on YouTube, uh, and we can link. I'll link it in the chat now for anyone want, who wants to rewatch it. <laughs> sorry for ruining this classic piece of new media art, but it's definitely, <coughs> definitely worth a deep dive into seeing the various performances of this that are recorded. Um, so let me, let me explain it to you, which is not going to do it justice at all. But um, 
in this work, different parts of the body will trigger different instruments. So um, like the bass line can be triggered by the hand where like brass instruments could be triggered by a movement of the head. Uh, so body and sound are working very much together. Um, one of the interesting things about this piece is that uh, Rokeby worked on it over more than a decade. And so the technologies that were available to him from the time that he started developing it to the time uh, that he presented it in its final form um, were advancing. And so he, he had to do a lot of DIY stuff at the beginning. And then technology sort of caught up with his concept by the end of it, which is really exciting um, and it is sort of symbolic of how Media artists often are experimenting with technologies and pushing them, um, advancing them with, with their like conceptual uh, like practice. And in my research, I found that um, somewhere in Regina has a copy of Very Nervous System. So I'm not sure what institution owns it. Somewhere. And I'd be, does anyone yeah. know? Yeah, let's hear that in. If anyone's got that info in the chats, uh, it would be where where in Regina we can find very nervous system. Um, it makes me think, uh, Shauna, of this idea of accessibility that you sort of mentioned about in the last slide, and how just how inaccessible technologies that could be used to make new media art were the farther back in time you go in the 60s especially and then seeing watching over the course of uh david rokeby creating this piece uh the technology becoming more and more accessible and then the i the i i i uh did the integrated media program at ocad uh where uh, david rokeby teaches a class there but it's very much we watch this video a lot in that program it's very uh sort of uh, inspired a lot of what that program at at the Ontario College of Art and Design is, and um, now it's quite easy to do what he's doing, <laughs> which is another as funny okay. other evidence of like this in, the the way that technology becomes more accessible. But you could argue that it's only because artists like David Rokeby are pushing it to become. Uh, to to do certain things or to become make it possible for artists to do certain things using technology. Exactly. And yeah, when I presented Bicycle TV at Interaccess, people kept being like, this is just like a Nintendo Wii. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but like 20 years before that happened, like without a corporation behind them to develop it. I wonder how like those, the kind of heft of that work changes in that context, like with something like David's, David Rokeby's work being like maybe like or being impressive enough that it was at the Venice Biennial and then now it's being something that you could probably do um, in an afternoon in a classroom like, like and then how do you as a curator like contextualize that work now like if you were to show this piece in an, in an exhibition or would you like would you, <laughs> would you show that this piece in an exhibition? Yeah I think we'd really throw a around where it's like pioneering and cutting edge. <laughs> Just to emphasize that the fact that it was the first time that audience had, audiences had seen something like this, that's really important to me. And I think we do get a little bit desensitized to technology. Um, and sometimes I have to remind myself like how wild it must be for my grandma who's 91 to be using a smartphone and just be able to like touch a screen and do stuff, that is a major shift. I don't, I think we um, shouldn't forget about that. All right, so um, made reference to this exhibition a little bit earlier and uh, John Hampton will know it quite well because he co-curated it, uh, and he's now the director of programs at the McKenzie. Um, so, John, feel free to jump in if I misinterpret your exhibition. <laughs> um, yikes. But, okay, so um, World Building was presented at Trinity Square Video, which is an artist-run center in Toronto. It featured four uh, virtual reality 
networks that were developed, I believe, over for a year. Yeah, Correct? something like that. Okay. Um, and it, it was really featuring um, the way in which artists, again, can uh, challenge emerging technologies. And so many of the works in the show were investigating the consequences of virtual reality, um, thinking through how, in a commercial sense, virtual reality is currently applied. So VR is associated to, for me, I associate it with the American military, how it is used to simulate um, battle scenarios. And there's also this narrative of wellness associated with VR. So um, using virtual reality perhaps in a senior's home to help transport uh, folks who can't go outside into um, a natural landscape via digital goggles. So a lot of contradictions within the technology um, and the artists in this exhibition explored those. I wanted specifically to look at this piece um, by Kristen D. Schaefer and Jeremy Bailey that was called Praterna. Um, so in this piece, you put on the VR goggles and your body is transformed into that of a pregnant woman. Um, so you can, your hands are visible through these goggles and you're in a meadow and you can hear birds chirping. Um, one of the really interesting like embodied components of this piece for me was watching um, folks who were men or people who didn't seemingly have the capacity to become pregnant um, put on the goggles and were experiencing this transformation of body. Um, and I witnessed an individual um, sort of like attacking the virtual body and um, like slapping this their pregnant stomach, which I found so arresting, um, even though, of course, this is a digital simulation of a pregnant body, I still responded as though it was real in a way. Um, this piece, as Kristen and Jeremy articulated, is a lot about a couple who are um, are in disagreement about whether or not to have a child. Um, I think it was like a really amazing use of virtual reality to transport the body and, and um, experience something that might you might not otherwise be able to experience. And uh, the the um, behavior that you mentioned uh, that uh, one person doing sort of um, it drives it home this weird thing in VR work where it's like uh, it is even though it is a technological thing it is strangely and which this work brings out really well too is that it is strangely bodily in so many ways both in terms of it like needing to interface with your body really intimately uh, but also in terms of like like sort of blinding you and placing your body in like prominent display in the gallery for all the other people who are in the mm -hmm. gallery to see the way that you're performing within the piece Really, and even as someone who's quite familiar with um, technolo technologically engaged artworks, when I went to the opening for this exhibition, I still felt kind of strange about putting on the goggles and feeling myself be witnessed by other gallery goers while I experienced the piece, um, which I think is perhaps something that will evolve over time, but mm. that's a signifier for me that it's it's still an emerging technology and I haven't um, adapted to the conventions that the technology demands. I also Maybe. I imagine like, there, like it's uh, David Rokeby's and with this piece, there's like this, of, like needing to test the limits of the piece <laughs> um, in order to like, if I do this, will my stuff, like if I, my hand against the stomach will my hand sink into it like will it rest on top of it you know like this like how how convinced can i become by this technology or like if i move my hand really quickly in david rokeby's piece like will i 
of trip it up and like find the edge of this experience or something like that, like this kind of need to um, acknowledge the outside or something like that. That's such a good point. And it's a very funny tension between being like curator or the artist and then the user who's engaging with the piece because oftentimes new media works are so fragile, <laughs> like software wise and hardware wise. And so it's such a pervasive impulse for folks who want to explore those boundaries. And it was the same thing with bicycle TV. As soon one person got on the bike and just wanted to like bike as fast as they could. And every time I had tested it, I was like, do, 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 being like so tender with the hardware because I knew that it was, you know, so old and um, I didn't want it to break, but people are like, how do I break it? That's, that's part of it, I guess. They were used to their Pelotons in their condos. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, guys. <laughs> Um, yeah. So Turna, I think, is a really awesome example of how VR can be used um, to facilitate these alternative experiences of the body. And then a contradiction or a contrast to that work, I would say, is this piece called Real Violence by Jordan Wolfson, which was presented at the 2017 uh, Whitney Biennial. Um, I don't want to give this work too much attention, but it it did receive a lot of um, criticism in major publications like The New Yorker uh, and The New York Times, um, Art Forum, etc. It was kind of good that a VR piece was getting attention in these mainstream art publications, but it was getting attention, in my opinion, for the wrong reasons, or it was good that folks were being critical of it. Anyways, this piece, um, you put on VR headset and you are in the position of someone who is um, beating up someone else. And it's extraordinarily violent and you can't really remove yourself from the experience without taking off the headset. So it plays with um, the way in which VR can trap you in an experience which became controversial controversial and the Whitney had to install these um handbars which I don't know if you can see in this documentation image people had to hold on to a handrail because when they were experiencing the piece they were lurch trying to lurch out of it um so you can read up on that work uh if you're interested but it is incredibly violent and I don't really know if I like this piece or if I don't like this piece, it, yeah, it makes there's me feel conflicted clearly. Uh, is there any something. warning before you put on the headset? That's a good question. They probably introduce warnings later on, but initially I think people were going in with a blank slate. Um, the executive director at InterAccess, Susan Kordolovsky, she experienced this work and said that she found it incredibly disturbing and she felt like really nauseous afterwards. Um, something really interesting. I can imagine because you have a like vulnerable physical body by putting, you know, the VR headset on and not being able to see what's around you and then also vulnerable to whatever you're looking at and you can't easily exit it. So it's exploitative of that. And Jordan Wolfson is a, like a bit of a rabble rouser. So he definitely is doing that intentionally. Um, but maybe it's like that, that was an example of using VR for bad. Evil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Harsh. Thinking about like uh, the body but, you know, here, it's I really interesting so. um, to see how many uh, like gallery docents are clearly present in this picture. Yeah. Uh, you can see on the left hand side whether there's a rail that we can't see or not. There seems to be a docent who, with the name tag, who is touching the back of the person with the headset. And this is uh, somebody who's like uh, worked with this medium before. It's really interesting to see how like how much 
uh, although we talk about like virtual reality, how much infrastructure has to be in place to facilitate these pieces. Um, because if you see there's actually like paired up, there's a there seems to be a gallery facilitator with each person who's helping people put on these works. Um, and it, and uh, to have like a, a person so close uh, by and like kind of calmly touching you as you're experiencing this work uh, must have been quite, quite, quite something. <laughs> And even from a practical standpoint, that is so resource demanding to have a docent for each person experiencing the work. If you can imagine having a docent standing beside each person looking at a painting. <laughs> yeah, it kind of conflicts with, I mean, as you said, there's a lot of inherent uh, con contradictions within uh, new media work, but like uh, with virtual reality, uh, the idea that maybe it, uh, it doesn't rely quite as much uh, because it's this digital work or it, it can, the, it's self-contained or something that it doesn't rely on the same infrastructure that other pieces is, yeah, clearly uh, it comes clearly as a false in this image where we see there's just so much stuff that has to go on to make this piece work. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to hold up the conversation too much more, but I am curious. I feel like there's sort of a like with like the new media works we've been looking at, some of them are like kind of more DIY heavy where the person has sort of experimented and worked on a piece. And then there's others that are a little bit more expensive where you need like equipment and then also like the cost of labor of having like 10, 10 docents or facilitators to work with like each individual person at the station and um I'm, I'm yeah i'm curious about that kind of like uh, binary within like new media art of like either like very affordable kind of diy versus like the kind of very slick high end um and kind of what the dialogue is around that i guess um in terms of accessibility and um like how 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 curators are engaging with that? Mm. Um, yeah, I so I come from the artist run center world, which tends to be very DIY and um, so interaccess within their principles as an institution or a te it's a teaching institution. So there's open studio where technicians will be present that folks can come and bring in their new media artworks that are in development and get technical um, support. And so that that has more of, for me, it's like a grassroots sentiment to like break the technology, challenge the technology. Um, and a lot of tech you can buy online and, um, and you know, appropriate in whatever way you want. It, not everything has to be super, super slick. And also, of course, there's the professionalization of the art world. So folks are getting introduced to like pretty high end development um, techniques in university. Um, so there's that. John, how did like John and Kat, how, like where does your technical prowess come from? I consider you both very technologically adept youtube videos yeah totally youtube videos yeah. Really? yeah not like um the i feel like uh art school was a much more of a, a theoretical education which is like valuable v Very super valuable, valuable yes it. and like uh i wouldn't be able to do the work that uh i might be able to do with technology without um without doing like re uh, lear learning from the the people i learned from there and reading the books uh but we definitely didn't get just be because of the nature of uh, like the education where the people the the artists who are teaching at art school would have like learned their craft uh in, like dave rokeby is an example he's one of the people who's teaching there and he learned uh the, the his craft uh uh, quite quite a while ago. So the things, the technologies that are sort of like, I have my hands on day to day, um, uh, were not the things that like profs would have been uh, teaching at school. So yeah, like it, when we entered, it was like art school. It was like 2013, and like VR wasn't a thing. 
<laughs> so that, but, we, that you could access in the way that we can access it now. However, like the other supports for it are exactly what we were just talking about Trinity Square Video mm-hmm. or InterAccess. Uh, we, I was, we were, I was able to um, work on Yam Lau's piece in the uh, world building show because Trinity Square Video had. Uh, uh, previously given us a residency to um, develop uh, VR work, uh, just experiment with VR on our own, and then further um, hiring me to be sort of tech guy for uh, Yam Lau's uh, VR piece. So that let me learn even more. So it, yeah, I would credit much more the artist run culture for teaching me uh, how do you use technology to make art than uh, art school in that case. Excellent. Okay, so this is going to feel like a a quick shift. And um, and we definitely don't have enough time to uh, give the following works the attention that they deserve. So this is mostly going to act as a suggestion of works to look into on your own um, later on. It's going to be really bananas to try to summarize net art history in five minutes. Um, but, okay, so I will do my best here. We have, we have um, no, we have no want... t- time limits on our, so if you, you can take as long, as, oh, you can sense. go until you fall, uh, fall asleep if you want. We're two hours behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope our, our audience does the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lily, how are you, just checking in, how, how are you doing? I'm excellent learning <laughs> awesome john, john um, hampton okay. john hampton says three more hours <laughs> three more hours <laughs> attitude we want um okay awesome so first i wanted to talk about uh aria dean she is a curator at rhizome which is that organization that i mentioned in new york um they're dedicated to the preservation and promotion of internet art, largely. Um, so Arya is like this superstar. I can't believe the sort of intellectual, um, just, I don't know, she's just a genius. And um, so for example, this article called Closing the Loop, uh, she published with the New Inquiry 2016, I think she was only 23 when she wrote it. And um, it's an article that I return to. And I still feel like I haven't learned everything I need to from it. Um, To summarize it really quickly, she talks about the emergence of the selfie as a conceptual frame in contemporary art and how it quickly became co-opted by this like white feminist discourse and how the selfie has this critical potential for non-white artists, how it feeds into um, these narcissisms and the supremacy of the the white female artist. Um, So yeah, it's a really amazing read and there's, there's just like so much to get out of it. Um, I feel like you're familiar with this article. Do you have do you have any takeaways from it that you want to mention? Or I don't mean to put you on the spot. Pat and John. I think that I think the audio got cut off for a second. Or <laughs> we've posted the uh, link to the uh, the article in the chat for those who uh, want to follow up with it. Uh, it's uh, pretty uh, slick and quick read. It's it's a great it's a great piece. Yeah. Okay, and then the other the next piece I wanted to highlight um, that she wrote okay. was part of the catalog for the art happens here. Um, I don't I don't have a screen cap of it because it only appears in print. <laughs> here, which is not helpful for you guys. Um, <laughs> but it was, uh, yeah, it was included in the catalog for Nat Art Anthology, which as I understand was parts of the physical exhibition 
um, which was curated by Raya Jean, I believe, at least co-curated by her. Anyways, it was presented by Rhizome in partnership with the New Museum. And part of the exhibition was meant to travel to the Dunlop Gallery, yeah. um, but that was put on hold because of the pandemic. And when I heard that this show was to be presented in Regina, I was so jealous because it sounds like such a cool show. I read a lot about it. So I know. Yeah, we were pretty. Uh, yeah, thought that was it was it, it was uh, we were so pleased having moved here recently that it was going to be here. And then so so I so strange to have it pulled out from under us like that. I think it's still there, but just locked down. <laughs> Oh, I think I think it's it's I think some of it is still installed but locked down. But I could be wrong. Uh, like Schrodinger's ne Schrodinger's net art know. exhibition. Who knows? So, okay, let me explain the exhibition better than I have. Uh, okay, so art happens here was a um, initiative and an exhibition that saw Rhizome restore internet artworks that range from 1984 to 2016. So they preserved the works or restored the works and released them online over a period of time. And then they exhibited a selection of those restored works um, at the new museum. So many of the works that we're going to look at now um, were part of the art happens here. Um, now we can go to the next slide. Thanks. Okay, so this first piece um, is called Blackness for Sale by Keith and uh, Mindy Obadike. Uh, they are a, a couple who practice together um, in literature, literature, poetry, and net art and sound art. They have a very interdisciplinary practice. Um, so this piece is from 2001, and it was part of a larger series uh, called Black Art Actions. Um, and the basic concept of it was, um, as, as an artist couple, they put cakes, uh, blackness for sale on eBay, which of course is this e-commerce website um, a lot of net artists at the time were thinking through the commodification of the body and these ideas of e-commerce, but a lot of net artists were missing the piece um, in thinking through the commodification of the black body. And this piece highlights that blindness within net art and um, foregrounds it here. So for this work, which was taken down after four days. Uh, they posted it on eBay. They didn't include an image. And they only included this description, which described the dangers of the product. Um, so it's a really, in the next slide, you can read through the description. It is, of course, very poignant for our contemporary moment. Was it taken down or did they take it down? It was taken down by eBay. Right. Which um, was all the more fascinating because they had posted it in the Black Americana section of eBay, which often saw caricatures of blackness and paraphernalia that was overtly racist. So it brought up this question of like, what kind of blackness can we put a value on? And we're circulating certain kinds of representations of blackness, but blackness as a concept, apparently, you know, based on the, the virtues of eBay can't be sold, but are clearly being sold in this other way. Yeah, well, it sounds like a kind of like an exterior, uh, likely like white projections of black um, subjectivity 
um, that are allowed to be kind of like consumed at any kind of like um, black, black subjectivity producing black subjectivity is then kind of like rejected is I guess is what at, um, they down kind of embodies or embraces. And I think another another point that they were trying to raise through this piece is way that there are sanctioned ways of the commodification of black identities, whether it's the appropriation of culture, um, and then obviously there's when it's like too pronounced or critically presented, that becomes uncomfortable for white audiences, basically. Um, and in reading through the like critical discourse around this piece, there's this historical lineage related to um, the commodification of the black body vis-a-vis -vis slavery, certainly. So that is underpinning um, this work as well. Is like a very heavy change from David Rokeby's very nervous system. We really launched into it, but I'm, I'm happy that we get to discuss it here. Yeah, and both like this piece as well further investigates the sort of um, uh, the idea of like uh, <laughs> the commodification of new of like what we could call new media art, like you were saying, and then directly engaging with, with commerce as an aspect of the medium um, is sort of a way that like, it's uh, also, it seems like it's fitting itself within the, the discourse that uh, David, that, I don't know, earlier um, uh, new media art, which was like trying to emphasize, um, like you were saying, it's ephemerality or it's uh, like, inability to be commercialized um this is like at the advent of when um non digital things can can start to be or sorry uh th things like new media art could start to be commodified using marketplaces uh that like ebay is sort of a uh an example of although it's not nobody's selling uh ephemeral new media art on ebay as far as you know mm -hmm. you know of. I I mean, that would be cool if they were. It would be. <laughs> and, and, and this quotation that I have here from Mindy Obadike speaks to what I'm about to say, in that in the early 90s, um, when net artists were emerging and the genre was being developed, the internet was being celebrated as this utopian space, uh, radically that concept is referred to as cyber utopianism, where people thought, oh, the internet is this emancipatory realm where um, markers of difference and whether it be gender, race can um, be democratized. And then very quickly it became obvious that the internet and the web was a, a domain that social inequities are just reproduced. It, it's not, it, it wasn't this like wonderful space where, you know, those, those things were erased. So this, this quotation um, speaks to that. Um, okay, so this next work is by Sandra Perry, who is an artist that I'm just getting familiar with, but she is a heavy hitter. She had a solo show in 2017 at Serpentine? Serpentine? Yeah, Serpentine. <laughs> and so this is a, a video work that is often showed in the form of an installation um, with other cultural works around it, but it is a piece that you can watch online. Um, as an artist, Sandra Perry really values openness 
uh, and access to technology. So she makes her pieces available on the internet, but and sells them or just licenses them to institutions. Doesn't sell them permanently. Um, oh, go on. Sorry. So this this is a single channel video uh, called "It's in the Game," uh, and it had it's very sort of like vapor wavy, which is a vibe that I quite enjoy. Um, she uses the um, what's it called again? Um, the the chroma key aesthetic is usually used, as far as I understand, to work as a uh, placeholder when you're going to replace a background in a video with a, a like a false background. Is that right? I feel like John and Kat will know because they're using the green screen. <laughs> you mean the blue color of the object? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If John had wanted to wear a green shirt, then we would have had to have a blue screen. <laughs> if he wanted a blue shirt, it's a green screen. <laughs> ref guys <laughs> um yeah so in a lot of sandra perry's works are autobiographical um, but this piece is particularly uh, personal it features photographs at the beginning of her and her twin brother sandy who um is a basketball player and his um image was sold by the national collegiate athletic association to EA Games or EA Sports, which is a video game company. Um, so since he played for a collegiate basketball team, um, he decided that he didn't have any rights to his image and then they sold it. So he found um, representations of himself in a basketball video game. So in this video, you see photographs of him and then Images of him represented in this video game. So she's questioning how much do we own representations of ourself um, and how are images of our likeness circulated online. Um, and then the video proceeds into documentation of artist and her brother walking through uh, to major art museums and looking at artifacts uh, that are of African origin. So again, we're questioning who possesses artifacts and visual likeness and um, yeah, it, it, it's a really fascinating video. Uh, Anything else? I was, I was really blown away by this piece. Um, when I first saw it, and I'm very excited that we're bringing it into the conversation today. Um, I think the slow burn of like kind of the reveal of um, like um, you kind of see the movement through the gallery and then you kind of map that on to her brother talking about his experience um, with this video game and what and them kind of taking his image in this kind of like um, looting that is uh, t taking place in terms of the objects that have been looted from these um, th from their like countries of origin uh, in Africa, and then um, the, like looting of these um, images of these black basketball players. Um, and he kind of her brother goes through them and is like, "Oh, I remember this guy. I remember this guy." And he can like mm -hmm. um, he kind of brings them back to life as regular people. Um, at like as his peers um, and I just uh, I was thinking a lot about this in contrast to the Aria Dean um, article around kind of like um, the inability um, or the disempowerment of um, I think in Aria's article it's about kind of like more the female figure and the female face but this inability for people to um, capture their own images and have them presented in the same way and with the same kind of like um, objectivity that is kind of permitted to um, the white female selfie <laughs> and the kind of power that that um, 
kind of yeah the power that is taken away by kind of the by ea games or whoever is making those games making making those polls and deciding that they don't even get compensated for that really and in closing the loop uh aria dean talked like has to work through this conflict between do do black female identifying artists participate in this selfie discourse and um, structure or do they not? And it's this conflict of visibility versus invisibility. Like, do you just totally tap out of that practice that has its consequences or do you participate in it, which also has these like icky, um, I don't like, yeah, these icky affiliations and um, Oh. Yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. There seems in uh, Sandra Perry's uh, piece, there, there's uh, some, I, or, or like what you were saying, Lillian, of when um, her brother is talking about the digital likenesses of his fellow teammates and sort of rehumanizing it. That is some degree of like, uh, like, taking back or reappropriating what the sort of like the pillaging that EA games in the NCAA is doing by stealing their likenesses. And uh, as well, I maybe, maybe you could see the 3d scans be that, because I think these 3d scans were created by the artist in the, from the pieces in the museum, uh, sort of uh, surreptitiously at was, is that, is that true? She sort of just casually did 3d scans with her phone while she was visiting the museum. I think I read that they were freely available online. Nice. Yeah. So she like appropriated them. There's some, it's like a um, sl small, it's a small, uh, it's a, uh, a small victory, but there is, it's like this technology does give us some power to uh, create our own meaning, even when the meaning is like stolen away from us by big corporations. <laughs> totally. And the link to the video is uh, in the chat for- the um, Okay, and then this next work uh, is by an artist named Rafia Santana, who herself um, actually does as uh, like selfie gifts. And I think um, Aria Dean mentions her in the article as um, sort of successfully tackling the selfie as a construct um, and imbuing it with criticality. Um, so this piece started as a um, Facebook post that she made where she asked, uh, she was like reaching out to her white friends and said, can you, soup and NyQuil delivered to me and then she was like is this how reparations work mm -hmm. and then that ballooned into this grassroots initiative uh, where white people would donate money and then she would act as the administrator and um, get that money to pay for food that was delivered to people of color by POC folks um, and and it created this major dialogue about reparations, uh, white guilt, and how um, people participate in anti-black racism. Like when you're sort of looking for something to do as a white person, which some of us might be interrogating and doing some self-reflection on that now, um, this piece was sort of offering that up as, as an option. Um, so it started in 2016 and it's ongoing. And this piece again was featured in uh, Art Happens Here, the, the Rhizome exhibition. And there's this like fun question with this piece uh, about like, is it art? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that matters, mm -hmm. uh, but Rafia is certainly an artist and this is part of her praxis. So, yeah, I think it's like a very exciting work that entered into the art world consciousness. Um, and here's a collage of feedback that she got uh, while she was doing the project. And folks who donated and folks who were also the recipients of, of the project. 
This is a very uh, feel good comment wall. Yeah, yeah, it's it's neat. But there was there's also this element. Um, sorry, if we can just go back for yeah, one sorry. moment. Um, this element of the artist having to do so much of the labor to coordinate between basically white people and BIPOC folks. Um, so there is this question of like, is it fair for her to have to act as this fulcrum and do that emotional and physical labor uh, between these sides, if you will? Okay, so this is the second last work I think we'll talk about. Um, this work was presented uh, when I worked at InterAccess uh, at Vector Festival, which is a festival that InterAccess runs. It's a new media art um, festival. So it's presented by this artist named A.M. Dark, teaches at UC Santa Cruz in uh, games and playable media, digital arts and new media, and critical race and ethnic studies. Um, so this manifested as a Snapchat performance where she realized that a filter on Snapchat was misrecognizing her breast um, as her face, which was an inherent flaw within the code that was favoring um, lighter skinned folks. So uh, we decided to miss that flaw or that error, that glitch, and turn it into a performance to draw attention to the bias that was embedded within the technology itself. And when we presented this piece, um, we presented it on an iPhone because that was the way that most folks um, would have it in its original form. Um, so it was just a little iPhone presented on the gallery wall. Uh, yeah, I think it it's like relatively simple, but also really critical. You get the concept right away. And I it just has a lot of the components of a really great new media artwork, in my opinion. Yeah, it kind of um, related to what we were talking what, about with Paterna, trying to kind of push or like find a breaking point or like that um, schism between like reality and virtual reality or augmented reality. Like um, they've kind of embraced that <laughs> um, and really? kind of um, leaned into that moment of uh, kind of barrier breaking between the two. Oh, it's, it's... I think, like, this... sorry. No, no, please go. Um, this piece is still, is even hearkening back to the thing that Nancy Patterson was dealing with to a degree in 1989, where she was surrounded by white dudes who were working with technology and wasn't, um, yeah. and so she she was having to be like critical of that technological realm and am dark though in of course a different way is also recognizing the biases and um like yeah with it within advanced technology and trying to challenge those while also being like incredibly technologically adept and I'm curious about this. I don't like some like some of the work um, we've looked at just like the last two, I guess, are, don't really fall into this category, but they kind of do like there's this um, sense of humor that is either like a dark sense of humor or like a kind of sheepish sense of humor or wit and or a wink almost that happens. And I notice a lot it a lot in new media art where like you know most contemporary art isn't funny like it doesn't go there and i wonder what it is about the, like new media art like category or like the kind of vast like concept of the medium like that um kind of allows that even like um with rafia santana's work 
like the the color and the kind of like um, comment section with like there's this kind of it's not lighthearted it's is it's um, still heft to the work but I am really curious about um, kind of like reoccurring theme I guess totally. I feel like that is a huge um, component of net art specifically because it is the realm of um, community and memes and gifts and like quick consumption and mm. these artists are riffing off of those aesthetics um, and for Rafia Santana's work, the, the first po like official posting she made about the project was using the, the meme font that we all recognize is a, a brilliant way to demand the viewers um, participation because we're so used to memes being this like one-to-one -one experience where you ex like zoom it on your laptop. Um, but then she was appropriating that way of viewing that we know of memes, applying it to this thing that was demanding your participation in a totally different way. Um, yeah, it, it is so funny even to say that contemporary art doesn't typically invoke humor. We like take ourselves so seriously. Mm -hmm. On Hampton would beg to differ, but. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it has something to do with like the community orientation and how incredibly contemporary new media art can be. So things haven't been like canonized and put into these staunch institutions and there's still some free flow in terms of like the semiotics that are going on on the internet. Um, there's more play available. There's something too about trying to, uh, a lot of the work is doing, um, is performing different criticisms about the medium that it's using um and that often like take this sort of like dystopian tone to it because uh the work is operating within these like on these platform like snapchat for instance on a pl is a platform that's like a huge uh it's like part of global capitalism or whatever so there's that sort of tension i i think um uh, humor is something that you do to deal with that sort of tension or the like the 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 feeling that you're you're using these uh, tools created by corporations that um, are probably really evil so uh, at least that's where the sort of like um, I don't know the dark humor might come from I also feel like I really associate Snapchat with teens. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> big time. It's fun to be a teen. It's fun to <laughs> be a teen. Teens are funny. Teens are it's a really blanket statement about teens. Remember that that it's damn Daniel guy, funny. that guy who was like, "Damn, Daniel, that was pretty funny." Yeah, I also I've seen like uh, actually never mind. We're gonna go off topic. <laughs> We're Next slide. Cool ourselves. <laughs> um, how how are you uh, feeling for time, uh, Shauna? Uh, would you like to um, uh, ask for some aud audience questions? Or we, we can co keep going or tap out whenever you want. Mm -hmm. Let's do this last work. Sounds awesome. great. Uh, That's folks cool. who have maybe been uh, uh, ra uh, rapping watching, attention. Watching and, patiently. Yeah, please feel free to put those questions out uh, uh, or the or, or reference the <laughs> references. Uh, also All you patient teens out there patiently watching our, <laughs> our Snapchat live streams. <laughs> uh, yes. Listen, that's our cool audience. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry. Well, yes, start preparing your questions and we will spend some time talking about that. But... Um, yes, uh, let's, let us talk about this work now. Okay, so this last work um, is what I would consider a new media artwork, but it manifests as a physical object, and it was meant to be exhibited in the show at the Dunlop. Um, and it's basically a censored dictionary uh, that was produced by Ying Mao 
um, where she Googled phrases or words uh, while she was in China when Google was still available. And she blanked out the words in the dictionary that were censored on, um, on Google in China. Um, so it's bringing attention to the censorship of the internet uh, in China, which is described as the Great Firewall. Um, she calls it the Chinternet. Um, those are her words. And yeah, what pervades throughout her practice is trying to represent um, the censorship that happens online in China and working within those constraints to express them to audiences outside of China. And so she works with GIFs and has this like very DIY website, like GeoCities almost aesthetic, um, then also produces these really uh, like crisp cultural objects we see here. Um, and then another component of this piece that I really like is that she left the definitions of the words that were censored but um, blanked out the words themselves. Mm. So you still can access the words uh, if you really dive into it, which I think mirrors the different ways that people try to circumvent the censorship that's going on online in China by using VPNs, for example. Mm. So you, you just have to work the angles and you can still get the information that you're looking for. It's like the meaning is still there, even if the word is is invisible yeah Unsayable. so if you can't access one part of it you you can just like do some ingenuity and in what you're looking for i really love this work because it really it kind of goes with the earlier what we were talking about yeah. Earlier. And, and yeah the last thing i'll say about oh. this piece is um while she was doing the project she was obviously searching for terms that were considered sensitive um and then Sometimes her internet access would just be completely cut off uh, temporarily because it was pushing um, against the constraints of, of the system. Kat, <laughs> Kat's mic is quiet, which is all I also take. I take full responsibility for all the mistakes on the live stream. Um, but but uh, sorry, Kat, what were you going to say? Oh, I mean, it partners really well with what Shauna was just mentioning. Like this is really, um, this is a really great work uh, that kind of describes how that, like the, this misrepresentation of technology as like a neutral tool. Like it's very much, a t like it's very much a technology that has like its roots in a very particular like political and economic uh, function and so like we see here of course with this internet of like a of sort of a cyber utopia like there uh, that there is c c very different access to uh, this technology that is supposedly such a worldwide web well no this is not something that is actually accessible to everyone and we and uh, there is radically different access points for this and and this is just I love this work because it really highlights um, the that conflict yeah, a lot of the people who are calling it a sci the internet uh, sort of techno cyber utopia in the, in the 90s are now running a uh, PayPal or or Amazon or whatever. Yeah. Uh -uh. <laughs> um, um yeah. yeah. Rip off of what you said, um cat like AM Dark's work is course, also recognizing the non-neutrality of the technologies that we use. And I think challenges me personally to get out of this like very North American centric white woman perspective of technology, because I think a lot of the time the technologies I use were designed for me. And that's a privilege that I need to unpack. If you're not paying for it, you're the product. Whoa! Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like um, yeah. In terms of like free content online, um, and VR, uh, as what you were just saying, Shauna, of being like, 
uh, uh, recognizing your recognizing yourself as the uh, sort of like um, the the audience that the technology is privileging. Um, VR is the thing that makes that the most sort of like readily apparent uh, to me because it was like very much designed by like. Uh, white men uh, who are uh, like also had I don't I don't know who who look like me and have hair like me and just like it's it's not it no hair. No, being like <laughs> not much hair to fit it around uh, so it's like the the virtual reality technology makes that sort of like privileging of technology just like felt very bodily especially when in presenting vr pieces i'm trying to put it on different pe- various people's heads even if it's just like you're wearing glasses or something no, yeah and i remember when we were working on totally. uh, p- works of VR i work- think like oh. oh sorry just that that when we were working on early vr works with like a more rudimentary technology that hadn't been um more like had was was the developer's kit and not like and, and very much something made for developers only really tested by uh white male developers like it was very hard for me to use the headset and test anything that uh we were working on just because uh there were it, it, yeah um, on my body it was a lot more uh it felt a lot more nauseating and 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 that was something that was like mo- noted at the time that uh many many women were experiencing Uh, we could, um, we have a question. We have a question from the chat that I could pass over, uh, from our other fellow co coworker at the Mackenzie art gallery, uh, dear tech fam, um, asks on the topic of black mirror slash technology perversion. Do we think artists inadvertently play the role of the white hat hackers, uh, like one could argue works and experimentation a la Rokeby paved the way for development of motion tracking technology, et cetera. Um, so sort of that uh, pioneering aspect that you were talking about earlier, Shauna. Right. Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. I am still pretty idealistic about how artists engage with technology. Um, and I think there's always going to be like a well my ideal world there's a radical undertone to artists who are engaging with technology um so while they might show the potential of you know emerging technologies they'll always be there to like question the consequences Yeah, I, f- I feel like that's been demonstrated in the work that you've shown here tonight. And and there's I it's um sort of interesting how to see how the like ad- the uh, technological innovations that artists might be able to do eventually get sort of folded into this consumerism, like consumerist technology, but in the present artists are often the ones who are like uh breaking things in a way that's I don't know. Uh potentially critical or, or what have you. And I also, I wrote my MFA on glitch art, which is a art form that is specifically about breaking technology. Mm. Um, so I have a bit of a bias towards, I think artists engage with technology. It's an entire genre of folks who like break that shit apart. Amazing. Uh, well, I think just in consideration for your time here, Shauna, that's a great, uh, that's great. Breaking shit apart is a good place yeah. to, uh, <laughs> on the subject of up. new media, break <laughs> shit apart. Um, where can, uh, f- our audience, uh, find you and do you have any, uh, upcoming, uh, things that you would like, uh, to mention? Uh, I know you have a text coming up. Like a publication? Yes, did the re- yes a review is it? Oh right, right, right. Um, yeah. So I reviewed um an exhibition, uh, an online exhibition called "Well Now What the Fuck," um, <laughs> which was curated by co-curated by Wade Wallerstein, Lorna Mills, and 
I'm forgetting the third Faith, curator at the moment. Faith, Ho Faith Holland, who happened to be our last live stream oh. guest. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> the synchronicities are beautiful. Yeah. So it may be interesting. And for so, audience. yeah, I reviewed that incredible, incredibly large show. Uh, there's over 100 artists in it. Um, so I will put that in the at Discord chat. Does awesome. that exist? Yeah, yeah and I'll, we, we will it. pass it over to the, mm -hmm. the rest of the people, or other, the rest of the teens. Cool so, out. yeah, so it's very my next thing, and then uh, exhibition in Toronto if it goes forward in September. And that, where where is that again? So, I'm gonna be at Arsenal, uh, which is um, it's north of Bloor. <laughs> I don't know, that might not mean anything to folks okay. in Regina. Um, any chance that it'll be moved to a, a virtual exhibition if um, physical gatherings don't happen? No. <laughs> it's very... Catherine Richardson, who is the artist, is very um, dedicated to the physical experience of his media works. Yes, good, as he should be. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much uh, for that uh, uh, this brilliant presentation. Um, and thank you, Lillian, for uh, coming along for the ride with your expertise as our as our returning co-host. Yes, yeah, I think that the sort of um, uh, the the s specific framing that you're able to bring, Lillian, from uh, the your work as a curator was super useful to like further contextualizing this for other curators who might not be familiar with working with new media art, especially as because it, like I feel like part of the thing we're talking about in this live stream is now we're all sort of being forced to reckon with um, digital art in different ways. So um, it's nice. Thanks so much to both of you for helping us continue this conversation, which I just... My pleasure. Yeah, so much and Sean has graciously offered to uh, uh, share the power, uh, the presentation with us, uh, and we have all the uh, uh, which references the different artworks, um, and we can mm. will be sharing that with folks in the Discord. So if you want to join the Discord, uh, the link's just on the bottom, and uh, John and I will remain on the call for a bit. So if you want to chat a bit after uh, tonight's show, uh, feel free. Uh, to join the Discord, Discord and get in the conversation. And next week, um, we're going to be hosting uh, Maze Longboat, who's a new media artist working in video games. Uh, and we're going to be playing his uh, new work, Terra Nova. And uh, make sure to come back for that. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Um, Bye. Stop. Bye. Or wait. Uh, Out loop.